here. All right, well, we are in the book of Galatians, and uh, I'll just remind you that we've talked about the greeting and the occasion of the theme, their defection as, as uh, Judaizers were championing that it's great for you to be, you Gentiles, to be believing in Jesus, but if you want to really get saved, you're going to have to be converted to a Jew. You're going to have to have a full conversion, circumcised and everything, uh, because salvation is of the Jews and it's the Jewish Messiah and so on. And uh, Paul says, I'm just amazed that you fell for that. <clears throat> but that was their defection. So uh, a couple of things they, uh, they had to, because Paul was not teaching that, the Judaizers had to represent that he wasn't for a for real apostle. We who are in Jerusalem have the real apostles watching over us, and we know the truth. And um, so he had to defend his authority, which he did by saying that his message and his position of authority as an apostle was given directly by Jesus Christ. And then he goes into the true doctrine and explains. And he says, uh, he reminds them of their previous Christian experience. Very often, if you get off in your thinking, you want to go back to when you got saved. You want to think of what are the, the important things that happened that uh, changed your thinking to turn from the world and to God, to leave behind the things of the world. Then he goes into this wonderful explanation of the relation of the law to the Abrahamic covenant. They're only going back to the law because that was the thing that dominated Judaism at, at the time when Christ came. But he says uh, the law came after the thing that uh, gave the promise of salvation was the uh, Abrahamic covenant. This is the promise of Abraham that had three great parts. One, the promise of a land, the promise of a blessing of, of a people, the, the, uh, his nation that would come, and then the blessing to all the families of the earth. In his name, through his name, would all the families of the earth be blessed. And uh, these then were repeated by God, emphasized in the uh, land promise, the Holy Land promise, and this then included the fact that, uh, uh, that God would give Israel, that land, even at the very end in the kingdom when he comes back to planet Earth, conquers the Antichrist and uh, the, the stranglehold that evil has on the, on the Earth, conquer that, set up his kingdom, and that will be at Jerusalem, then uh, the, the entire Holy Land uh, to extents we haven't reached yet ever even under Solomon, uh, the, that will be given to uh, Israel. And Israel themselves will be a ruling nation. So then uh, he also gave the uh, Davidic covenant, which deals with the people, saying that a king would be born to, would come from David, David's line. And that king finally would be the seed that would crush the serpent's head, that seed being Christ. And uh, so the promise of uh, the, the, having a people and having a king on the throne. And the third emphasis about the blessing of all the families is what we call the new covenant. It was new to Israel because the old covenant was the law. The new covenant was dealing with salvation. And uh, he said that will happen when uh, the sacrifice is made and that sacrifice blood is taken before God the Father. The book of Hebrews deals with that. Which reminds me, let me stop in my review and say, <clears throat> um, at my wife's suggestion, uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, putting forth the um, outline of the book of Hebrews that I I used in preaching through Hebrews some years back. Um, not to say I'm proud of it, but, I, but I, I started the study for myself uh, because I had found out that all the books I had been reading about the New Covenant were severely lacking and misapplied. They were limiting it only to 
uh, to Israel and that to be fulfilled in the future and that it had no uh, nothing to do with us today and that's just wrong it was the uh, it was Christ who set it up um, uh, to uh, make it work uh, he fulfilled the new covenant by the shedding of blood and uh, dying on the cross and his resurrection and then uh, that would end with his ascension to heaven the presentation of his sacrifice it being accepted and then the sending of the Holy Spirit and so Hebrews goes through that and says this is how uh, salvation is brought that is the new covenant so for for Gentiles it's not the new covenant actually <clears throat> though that's a handy title it is actually God's plan of salvation for the Jews a new covenant new and fresh so the point of that was that I wanted to find out uh, what Hebrews had to say about it and I found that was that was the main theme of, of the book of Hebrews once you get into it so uh, I'll be putting that together we're going to make a book of it and um, uh, ha have it available to presentation for our the church's 50th anniversary uh, 50 years ago coming this November <clears throat> um, Exeter Avenue Baptist Church became Open Door Baptist Church and uh, one of the things that I wanted to remind myself to say to you is that you and and anybody that you know that has been attending or a member of Open Door in these last 50 years um, I would really love to get a uh, uh, some message for you to write out not about me now this is not about Pastor Weigel this is about the ministry of Open Door and that would be the ministry that you've received by the fellowship the ministry that you've received by by service uh, the blessing that God has been to you by Open Door Baptist Church and uh, so you can save the criticisms for later. But what we want to do at the at the uh, uh, at the anniversary is to actually read through some of these uh, blessings and let your voice be heard. So if you can spread that to people that are not actually with us uh, uh, anymore, um, I'll be trying to do that personally. I want all the I want to talk to the missionaries. I want to actually put a letter together and have Angie send that out as our missionary secretary. Uh, asking for their input, even those who aren't our missionaries anymore that uh, have been for a long time. So um, I think that'll be a, a, a glorious tribute to the glory of God uh, to see what this little church in our little neck of the woods um, has been a blessing to people through the years. All right, <clears throat> coming back to the New Covenant and the book of Hebrews. All right. We're now in point C, the relation of the law to the Christian faith. And he is saying that since the law came 430 years after the promise, nothing in the law, the, the law is supplementary. The law is the new guy on the block, but these, the rock, the, the foundation of it all, is the Abrahamic covenant. The promise of salvation comes from that, not from the law. It was never the purpose of the law to save. Therefore, it was, should never be the purpose uh, for true Christians to get back under the law. That's not, not part of the deal. The law was given to emphasize sin. We tend to always compare ourselves by ourselves, and we always come out the winner because we compare ourselves to bad people. You know, go straight to Adolf Hitler. I'm better than him, you know. Um, he kicked his dog. He did bad things. So we say, I'm okay because I'm better than somebody else. And uh, we just tend to do that. God says, all right, let me give you the law. That will be the, uh, the constitution of the nation of Israel. Gives it to them at, uh, when they pull them out of Egypt. Gives them to them at the uh, uh, Mount Sinai. Tables of the law, giving the Ten Commandments and then those representing all the other commandments. But this was to represent God's understanding of goodness, God's understanding of righteousness, God's understanding of what is sin and what is obedience. So that was there to open the eyes of people to their sin and drive them, asking them 
because there was nothing they could do to change that. That's who they were. They were doing what they were doing because that's who they are inside. And um, the law was to remind them of that and to drive them to fall on their knees and cry out for mercy to God, like the publican that Christ told about. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And uh, that was the goal of <clears throat> the law. So now the law to the Christian faith, he says that was a time of bondage for the Jews. It was a time of then finding freedom when Christ came. God found the fullness of time had come. He sent Christ, the, uh, whatever that means to God, the fullness of time. Everything was worked out. He had prepared the place and the time and the world, and now the gospel would be spread around the world. And uh, we finished talking uh, last time about the childhood versus full sonship. That illustrates the contrast between how God dealt with the Jews under the law and how he deals with the Jews and Gentiles under faith in Christ. We come then to uh, two parts of that. First of all, the law's preparation for sonship in verses 1 to 3 and now we're looking at Christ's fulfillment of sonship in verses 4 through 7. We've already dealt with the coming of Christ. Now let's look at the purpose of Christ in verse 5, to redeem them, the purpose. He came, then to redeem them that were under the law. That would be the Jews, wouldn't it? You see, they were under the law. To redeem them from under the law that we, and that would include, he's talking about the Jews still, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The adoption of sons, as I've mentioned, is a summary of the whole plan of salvation. That in the beginning, God decided to create living beings that he might bring them into the family of God. That they could be called sons of God, be adopted in to be sons of God. Uh, even as Christ is called the Son of God. These would be the adopted children, not, not uh, at all like Christ, except we try to be formed in his image. So uh, notice then that we compare back to chapter 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us, the Jews, from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So the, uh, the hanging on a tree was done after they were dead, but it was to display them as cursed of God. So uh, Christ on the cross the wooden thing, the word tree here is just the word for lumber, uh, tree, wood. So uh, he became a curse for us. So he says, um, he redeemed us, the Jews, by becoming a curse for us. That's what his death did. Um, it wasn't a fulfilling of law, it wasn't all these other things, it was taking the penalty. Here is an infinite being dying, paying an infinite price. That's what we owe because we are born in sin. So the, why does he bring this up? <clears throat> well, if Jesus redeems the Jews who were under the law from the curse of the law, then how little was the need for the Galatian Gentiles to submit to that law? They had already been saved out from underneath it under that pressure. Christ's redemption gave God his ultimate purpose for mankind, the adoption of sons. This is why he created man in the first place, and now, after sin, God makes this tremendous and horrible sacrifice to accomplish it. My wife and I were listening to uh, music on the way here, and we were listening to uh, How High the Price, then uh, just got us thinking. Both of us were kind of lost in our thoughts, it's hard for us to even imagine, we think dying would be a terrible thing. And of course, it was for Christ. But this is the original God. This is Almighty God. This is the one who existed when nothing else existed. This is the one who came up with the idea of creating human life. Uh, Peter, I think, is the one who said that uh, you killed the Prince of Life. You see, the, the prince and the prince is the leader, the, the, even the author of life. The one who gave life, you killed him. To, to think of 
God, I mean, if you look down at some creepy cockroach hiding in the blackness under a rock, um, the difference between God and us was greater than us and the cockroach. For him to limit himself in time and space and become as one of those little things that he made is just an incredible condescension of God. And then to choose the lifestyle that uh, he accepted, poverty, rejection, betrayal, um, how he didn't come to live in ivory palaces. He came just to live life at its basic form. And what a sacrifice that was. And then to die, and to die the death of the cross, the death of the cross was a study in prolonged pain. To hang someone by nails. Uh, they tell me that there was a seesaw thing going on where the pain in the feet, the weight of the body on the feet, resting on a nail going through both feet was so horrible that the very leg muscles would sh start shorting out and so the person would be would tend to pull up to, to alleviate that but then of course you're pulling up on the wounds that went right right through here at the base of the hand you can almost feel there's an opening in the bones there and uh, so it didn't break bones it just separated them right there I've had bones separated. It's not a fun thing. And now he's hanging on the cross with that. Pull it up. And then that gets to where you can't, the muscles start shorting out there, and you stand up again to relieve that pressure. And it's a back and forth seesaw thing until finally there's no strength left at all, and you just literally hang. And with that, it stretches out the chest. You can't breathe. And uh, the, the piercing of the side where water came out, you know, clear liquid, it was the uh, pericardium, the, the, uh, the uh, space around the heart was filled with fluid. And the, this was a post-mortem. They pierced that sac, and the blood and the water came out, indicating that's how his heart was suffocated to die. Uh, Horrible, 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 and uh, I haven't even got into thorns through the the stretched out skin on your on your skull, where normally you, you get cut, the the flesh can close in because the cells begin to collapse where the blood was lost, you know. But you can't do that there; it stays stretched open. Any any movement, and it just fresh blood coming out of the thorns in your brow, and then. Um, the, the horrible situation of the, the, the whips on the back he bent over and two men whipping the cat of nine tails and laying open the back, stripping the back, uh, turning them into strips that would hang, uh, dripping blood, and, uh, and then to put that back on the old rugged cross. Uh, just multiply the horror of it all. And this is what, what he gave for us. But in that, it was the infinite life that was dying for us. God is, an, is a transcendent being that everything that he knows, he always knows. Everything that happens uh, it is with him eternally. There is a sense in which Christ even now is on that cross, that the reality of it is ever present with him. So horrible to contemplate, and yet there was only one reason that he did it. We have it in our, our verse, hereby perceive we the love of God. He gives us pretty flowers. He gives us lovely clouds. 
No, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for others. This is the ultimate sacrifice of love. He loved you so much that he was willing to go through that. So that's why he did it. All right, the third thing then is the comfort of Christ in verse 6. Notice, and because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Notice again now the shift to ye. He's been saying we, we were under the law and so on. Now he includes the Gentiles back. And uh, so when the Holy Spirit um, took up residence in the heart of the Gentile believer, he gave an inner testimony of belonging to God as a son. This is one of the things that the Bible tells us is in, in 1 John talking about how we know we are saved is that there's a difference inside us. He actually emphasizes not so much the fact that one day you, you bowed and got saved, but that right now you see the difference in your life. You see that you are, you, you live as a saved person. Uh, this is the thing that if you're trying to excuse your backslidden condition, people say, well, I, I just don't feel saved. Well, it may be because you're not acting like a saved person. And that's one of the things that goes when you're not willing to, uh, to make the sacrifice of obedience. Uh, you lose the confidence of your salvation. So expect that. At any rate, um, he says, uh, John 14, 16, I will pray the Father. This is where he's predicting all this will happen. He will give you another, and this means another of the same kind, comforter. I have been that comforter to you now, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside to help. And he says, but he'll send you another of the same kind that he may abide with you forever. It dawns on me going over these verses that that never changes once we get to heaven. That God's work of the Holy Spirit is eternally with us, within us, abiding with us. In Romans 8, 15 to 16, For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We have that within us. Now, Abba, Father, uh, Abba is the Aramaic uh, from the root Ab for Father. And then um, Father translates the Greek Pater, Pater. So he's just using both the Aramaic. This is like uh, Peter's name was uh, uh, the Petros. Is, uh, we get Peter from that, rock. And... Um, and then the Aramaic is Cephas, so you hear both names, um, Saul and Paul, same type of thing, although they're not exactly meaning the same thing, but there's the Aramaic, which was the current form of Hebrew at the time, and then the Greek. Um, people have said, well, Abba sounds like Papa, so we're calling God Papa. Well, that's all very cute and all, but uh, it's not sustained by the language. All right, the seventh verse, we see the brotherhood of Christ. <laughs> this great God, this infinite God, transcendent God, existing in all of time and space, becomes our brother. <laughs> How ridiculous is that, you know? Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Ladies, don't get offended that he's calling you a son. This was that position of authority in those days. See, that was the meaning of it. Um, you could say child, it works out all right, but uh, if you understand that you became the one who inherits, he's going to get to that in a minute. But <clears throat> what we recognize is that um, there are no more a servant as they were under the law but become a son. 
And he says, and if a son, then you have this privilege, then an heir of God through Christ. I think we, this fact that Paul is eager to bring out to the Gentiles, you already have become a son of God and one who inherits what God gives as, as the heir of a, a wealthy Roman family would enter into the position, the wealth, the command, the respect. Uh, so we enter into that of God, the Father, and we do that, of course, through Christ. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Predestinate doesn't mean the whole Calvinistic thing. It means plan, the, the previous plan, the thing that was planned ahead. So he also planned ahead to be conformed to the image of his son. He can't take us, holy God can't take us as we are in sin. After we get saved, we have all the crummy rottenness of sin st stinking upon us, and we have to get that cleaned up and changed to become conformed into the image of son. That he, Christ, might be the firstborn, he was God's firstborn, among many brethren. So we become brothers of Christ. He becomes our older brother, and uh, we are co-heirs with him. So having graduated from servanthood under the law to maturity through faith in Christ, these believers are sons. And the characteristic of sons is that they are heirs of their father. And I think that uh, we lose this by preachers getting so excited about having a point of, of preaching to say, no, you want to become an overcomer. You want to become, uh, you wanna, don't, don't be left out in the inheritance and so on. I don't find any room for that in the scripture, that you got the inheritance not by works you did as a Christian, or will do, but by becoming a son. You see that, you see that here. <coughs> the Galatian believers were heir to the promise God gave to Abraham and to his seed. That promise was his blessing, God's blessing. As Abraham himself experienced it, God counted him as righteous. So he was justified in the sight of God. You get all of that, which Abraham, the father of the Jews, received, <coughs> not by his good works, but by his faith. You, by faith, go directly to be a son of, a uh, of Abraham, a son of God. Be justified by God. He takes us then into an examination of the folly of returning to the law, foolishness. This will take us through verse 20, but let me uh, set the place for that. Since we know that the law of God holds many benefits to any who learn from it, we want to be very precise here about not being under the law. Paul here equates turning to Judaism with turning back to paganism. Now, it's going to take a little bit to get our mind around that. He does not speak of all the wisdom the Christians can find in God's wise and compassionate law. He speaks of trying to get into God's favor by performing certain works. This isn't how you can do it. It is not by the works that brings you into favor with God. This is wrong thinking. Uh, you don't elevate yourself over others by your good works, and therefore God loves you. This is, this is wrong thinking. Preachers are guilty of this. A lot of people are guilty of this. Christ had delivered Paul from a Christless Judaism. Paul was not awed by the whole process of keeping the law. He understood what it drove him to. He understood that once you remove the truth of Jesus as the Messiah, as the sacrifice for sin, Judaism becomes an empty shell of religious ritual. You've taken the heart out of Judaism. We tend today to think of Judaism as it is today, 
as it was in the Old Testament before Christ came. It is not. They are actively denying Jesus as Messiah. They don't even read the, the Isaiah 53 in their synagogues anymore. Sounds too much like Jesus. Because it is. Here's the danger of this. Preachers have convinced themselves that their works are so valuable to God that he will excuse their secret sins. Well, I, I do this, and I know God knows it, but you know, I'm really serving him, and I, I think I, I have this privileged thing there. He's going to not notice if I do all these secret sins. Yeah, well, God has a way of just blowing that up in your face, printing it in the newspaper and blazing it over the radio. Backslidden Christians have assumed that if they put in their time attending services, giving to the offerings, performing prayers before meals and all that, they're fine with God. It's not by your works. It's by a dedication of the heart and by faith. Man in his basic nature, if you go back to the, the natives of uh, illiterate tribes all over the world, Africa, Australia, American Indians, you, you begin to see man's religiousness as a basic nature of man. You begin to see how they exercise their religious thinking. And uh, so the attitude is, I'm not going to get involved with that. I will let the priest and the medicine men take care of the deeper stuff. I'll just obey the rituals. When they have the dance around the fire thing, I'll just do that. And uh, everybody else is doing it. I don't have to feel too stupid, you know. But I'll do the ritual, and uh, then I'll be okay with God. This is wrong thinking, see. This is not how you gain favor with God. Man in his basic nature is ritualistic in his religions. And uh, it'll keep the God or the gods off my back. I uh, don't want to mess with gods. They'll do crazy stuff to you. All right. So let's get into his argument here. Number one, returning to the law he argues, was inconsistent with their Christian experience. Verses 8 to 11. Notice, first of all, then, the Galatians had worshipped things that were not true deities. They were the Gentiles. They had no idea what they were doing, but they were had, had their basic religions, their Greek religions, Greek and Roman. But they were worshipping things that weren't true deities. He says, Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, before you got saved... You did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Paul addresses the Gentile converts at Galatia, at the Galatian city of Lystra, for instance. Paul and Barnabas had witnessed the eagerness to worship Jupiter and Mercury, or um, Zeus and Hermes is the, the Greek name. Acts 14, 11 to 15. Here's take you back to that story. And when the people there at Lystra, saw what Paul had done, which was the healing of a man who had never walked. He, he was born lame. He had never put one foot in front of the other. No parents had ever said, that's it, good, take another step, come over to me. His legs were, I don't know, wobbly or something. Joints didn't work, something. He had never walked, and now he was walking, which is two miracles. One is that he had the strength to do it, and the other is that he automatically learned how to walk. You know, people that have... I've heard you had your big toes amputated. They had to learn to walk again. This man knew immediately how to walk. So it was a, you know, an indisputable miracle. And when the people saw that, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, which Paul and Barnabas didn't understand, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Mercury was the messenger of the gods. And uh, it was Jeremy uh, Thompson who first uh, came up with this, reading through the mythology of those days, found that in this area 
The story was that uh, Jupiter and Mercury came visiting in, in disguise, looking as normal humans, and asking for a pl uh, food and a place to stay. And everybody rejected it all through the valley. They got up to a mountainside, and there were two older uh, husband and wife there, and they said, well, we don't have much, but you're welcome to our hospitality. And, and uh, so they, they revealed themselves as gods, and they said, we're going to condemn this entire valley because they showed us no hospitality. And then I think it was a flood that came in and killed them all. And these people, instead of uh, dying, uh, they were turned into two great trees that uh, stayed, and his, their house was turned into some sort of a shrine or temple. So um, this, uh, they had this in mind, saying, they're back, and we better accept them because we don't want the place fluttered and destroyed. So uh, uh, they called him Jupiter and Mercury. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which, when the apostles, Barnabas Paul, heard of, what is going on? What's go Did we happen to come in on a celebration day? He says, this is for you. He says, they rent their clothes, you know, tore, they didn't rent a tuxedo, but they did was they tore their toga. They ran in among the people crying out, saying, sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities, these emptiness, this <laughs> foolishness. Unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are therein. We healed him not by our power, but by the power of God. So getting back to the verse, when ye knew not God means when you did not perceive the true God. You didn't comprehend it, see, back in those days. You did service unto them. Now, did service is the word meaning to serve as slaves. You enslaved yourself to them. And them which by nature are no gods. This word by nature is the word we get uh, physical or physics from. And uh, it refers to what they were in themselves as opposed to what the men who made them said they were. They were supposed to be gods, but they were not. <laughs> They were just ideas and things and stuff carved. So he is saying that they are not the same class of being as the real God. Don't fall for the superstition of the world. I, I kind of enjoy uh, watching the stories uh, where they uh, uncover some ancient thing and this God has powers and stuff, you know. But it's all, it's all mythology. It's just tricks. None of that worked. None of it was real. They have no power. So, he says they are no gods. He uses the term here, theos, the word that the Greeks reserved for the high or the heavenly gods. Those were the, like the ones who lived on Mount Olympus. The lesser gods were called daimon. And we get the, the lesser term daimonion is the lesser one, and we get our word demons from that. So, let us realize in what he's saying here. They're not really gods. That all religions, aside from Christianity, are false, not just a variation. Their deities are not true gods. Superstition calls for us to accept some basic truth in these religions. But that is superstition. It's a false religion in itself. The Greeks had multiple words for God. Demons, daimon, theos, the high heavenly gods, the Olympians, which tends people to have the error of dualism. And dualism is the idea that from the beginning there was the good God and the bad God. There was the God of light and the God of darkness. The God of righteousness, love, kindness, and then the God of chaos and the God of evil. And they were eternally at war one with another. I mean, even in some of the great works of theology of people that should have known better, you're talking about God and Satan in their near eternal conflict. Wake up. He just made an angel that fell, and that's Satan. 
Uh, Satan holds no terror for God. Uh, Satan is one of those created things that is, you know, man to cockroach uh, apart from each other. At the end, when God wants to throw Satan and his demons into a pit of isolation for a thousand years, God just looks over at one of the angels and says, go wrap him up. He goes over and grabs him, wraps him in a chain, whatever that means, and throws him in the, the pit, covers it over, and he's stuck there for a thousand years. You know, no, no fight, no bombs, no blasts of energy, none, none of this is happening. So some angel just wraps him up and throws him away. This is no problem for God. Do you know, as in the book of Job, God checks on Satan to see what he's doing. And he says, well, I would be working on this guy, but you won't let me touch him. God, is, God has them all bounded in, has him on a leash. Uh, dualism is just silliness. Um, they, uh, what's the name? Uh, Zoroastrianism. Um, the great music from uh, the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, that boom, 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 you know, the, when the big monoliths are found and so on. That was uh, written by Strauss, I think, and, and it was called Thus Spake Zarathrusta. And uh, the evolutionary belief at the time was that uh, he was the first one to come up with the idea of good and evil, uh, Zoroastrianism. This was actually the uh, god that uh, the Persian commander uh, Cyrus w believed in. And Isaiah writes to him, <laughs> Uh, before he was even born, before Zoroaster was born, who created the religion, and uh, says, uh, I'm the God who is both the God of the light and the dark. I'm the God of, the, of life and of death. Uh, um, and I know your name, Cyrus, and I want you to just let my people go. And he says, okay, well, I better do that. Uh, God is just all powerful. All right, in the last five minutes, let's check with the next verse. Now they had come to know the true God. Now they had come to know the true God, away from the other gods. But he says in verse uh, 9a, <clears throat> um, but now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God. That's kind of an interesting play on words. Um, why does he say this? Well, ye have known God is, uh, and then are known of God, the first phrase is an aorist active participle. Participle is like ing, doing, uh, hitting, eating. And this is active. They're doing it. So you have begun knowing God, and this is the knowing by experience. The second is an aorist passive, have begun being known of God by experience. So now you know God by experience because you've, you've experienced the new birth. You were born again. And at this point, you are known of God. And this is that knowing of a family knowing. This is where you are known as my own person. You know him, he knows you. So that's a wonderful combination to understand this. So this kind of knowing refers to the personal relationship between God and the believer. This is the uh, practical knowledge. This is the knowing uh, who we are. This is the Holy Spirit living within us. That's you know, perfect knowledge. Knows our thoughts even better than we know ourselves. All right, we'll stop there and... Uh, We'll get back to that next time, as God allows. Comments or questions? Bring up some.